Okay, so today we are joined by Diamond Dallas Page. Welcome on the podcast, Diamond. Wow, good to be on, buddy. Good to be on. We have that mutual friend, Anthony and Gogo. So uh, glad he set it up. Indeed. So, so are you known as Diamond, or is it is it Dallas now, or how do go, people refer to you? You know, a lot of people. You know, they it, sometimes it is Diamond, sometimes it's Dallas. DD, I swear to God, it's it's, it's whatever someone likes. I, my my page is my original first name, but I don't let people call me that because then it confuses it. You know, with <laughs> Dallas Page, I, you know, like John Wayne did. Uh, I, I changed my name, you know, thirty years ago to fit where I was branding myself. You know, okay, so Dallas that, I'm, works. I'm assuming that, was, works. that was wrestling, right? When you were just getting into wrestling, right? Right. When I when I started to see it come together, I realized that like. I knew no one was ever like you couldn't use Paige Joseph Falkenberg as a wrestling name. That was never going to draw any money. And I love the name Paige. And I actually really love the name Dallas too, because I was a Dallas Cowboys fan, which is one of the football teams in our country. And um, I, I one day I just put them together, Dallas Page, when I was trying to do this wrestling thing in 1979. And it didn't really start to take off for me because I started and I stopped and I came back. And, you know, when you start and stop a goal, it never happens. You have to be driven, focused, and put the work in. And really, if it's a... a um, a dream or a goal that seems absolutely impossible, the more focused you have to be. And so at some point in 1992, I just went all in. And uh, it, it really, it, it, it helped me. And it was frustrating at times because it looks like it's not going to happen. And, you know, bottom line is Diamond Dallas Page, the wrestler, started actually brand himself as a manager, a color commentator, later on become a wrestler at 35 and a half. But when I finally exploded and my career actually hit, I was 40. You know? That's, crazy. That's when my career took off, 1996. So, so in those, because that's a bit of a, a gray area, really, that, that I haven't heard much about and, and nobody seems to talk to you about too much. But what happened in those years? So obviously in... In the seventies, you were you were starting this this career, right? And you said you was kind of stop, start, stop, start, and then right. there's there's this mindset shift now where you're like, look, if you're gonna do something, you gotta do it properly. You gotta apply yourself to it. So what happened in that time scale? Was was there like a mindset shift, or was there did you go to something yeah. else? What happened? Yeah, what what, what I was in a nightclub business since I was seventeen. Started on day crew. And I just turned 18 and they're like, hey, you want to work the floor? Because I was 6'4". I didn't look like this when I was 18. Yeah, I was skinny. I was like a buck 80. You know? So, um, but, you know, yeah, I've been going in, you know, small little nightclubs, you know, for, you know, for a couple of months by that time. And, you know, I couldn't get fit. I couldn't get laid with a fistful of pudding pardons in a woman's prison. You know, I mean, I just... Because no women were going to really talk to me in it. But you put a shirt on that says, like, Art Stocks Royal Manor, and all of a sudden, women will come up and talk to you. Like, it was crazy. And I and I loved, I went from a floor man to um, a uh, bar back, cleaning behind a bar, to a bartender, to a system manager. I had done, in five years, just about everything you could do in the nightclub business, and I was trying to wrestle and I'd only probably worked on it for three months. And I had three matches. I was horrible. I banged the hell out of my knee bad. It was the same knee. I walked out in front of a car, the car hit my knee, my face bounced off the hood and I flew 42 feet from the point of impact. So it was that same knee. And I thought, well, I'll just take some time down and I'll get back to the training. And then I got my first, job as a bar manager for this little rock and roll bar played rock and roll on the weekends it was just a regular bar you go in like a pub you know during the week and there was ones on both sides a pub on both sides so it became a great little hub and to be perfectly honest Phil, i got wrapped up in the booze the broads and the party 
I was living the dream. You know, I was, I was, I, I was having so much fun. And then I left and went to Houston, Texas, because I wanted to be a part of that whole urban cowboy thing. And I learned more and more about the nightclub business. And then I got to run a big club, big club. Everybody's heard of Bruce Springsteen. Well, he played in a place called the Stone Pony in Asbury Park. I opened up a huge club, like 1,500 people a block away. And again, I got like, I, by, by that time, wrestling in the 80s had blown up. And I was so mad, I stopped watching. And because I should have been a part of that. Like, I knew it. The truth is, at the age and the immaturity level that I was at, the party, the partying level that I was at, it would it would not have been good for me. You know, I was too young, and I could party with anybody back then in wood, and I had to learn that that's not a good idea. You know, especially I mean, so many, and you've seen it. Some of the greatest athletes you've ever seen have been taken down by booze and drugs, recreational drugs. Because they, they, they think they're the king of the world now, I can party strong as hell. And a couple of them can. But at some point, boom, they're going to hit that wall. So if I would have stayed in wrestling, it probably wouldn't have been too good for me. Um, but I did it. And I, I ended up running a huge nightclub in Florida. And Jake Roberts walked into my club. This is in 1986. And I thought Jake Roberts, by that time I'd been watching again because Jake was, you know, he pulled me back in to the tube. And when I saw him walk in the club, I was in the back office. And there was a camera on my front door, on the front door. And I see this guy walk in, he's got long hair and a full man too, and he's huge. I'm like, that looks like Jake Roberts. So I ran around the outside of the club because there's like 1,200 people in the club. You know, I'd have to like really be searching to find him. But I know if I walk in the front door, he just walked in. So I walk in the front door and I go, Judy, did a guy walk in here look like Jake Steak Roberts? She goes, yeah, everybody thinks it's him. So I run in there like a you know, friggin' Mark, like all excited to see him. I slow down. I get cool. I walk up. I go, so, uh, hey, bro. You, Jake the Snake Roberts, who wants to know? I said, the guy who runs this place, he goes, yeah, what can I do for you? I said, what are we drinking? And that's how I met Jake. And have you ever seen the resurrection of Jake the Snake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen? Okay. So think about this. I meet Jake Roberts in 1986. We got like shit face drunk then. <laughs> and, and I'm right there. I was just so happy. Six was like the height of it all, right? Jake it was, was like, like it was boom, boom, God. Jake was a god. And he was in there by himself. You see, if you were if you wrestled in Miami and then the next night you wrestled in Tampa, that's 287 miles. In the middle was Fort Myers. Florida, and that's where I was at. So it was just happenstance, man. And Jake would tell the boys, hey, there's a guy who's a huge mark, good guy, go in there, I'll take care of you. I just grabbed this other picture. Ted DiBiase, this is uh, Ted DiBiase and Luke from the Bushwhackers. Look at my head of hair back then. <laughs> um, but I got to know all the guys, and one day, um, I was watching up on the screen when my it were the closing. I had 13 bartenders. So I mean, we're a we are a jamming joint and we're all making money. And I'm looking at the video screen and it's a video called Girls Just Want to Have Fun by Cindy Lopper. Have yep. you ever heard of it? Yep. Girls just want to have fun. Yeah, I know the, well, the Captain Lou Albano. Yeah, Captain Lou Albano is in that video playing her father, you know, who wants her to calm down. And he thought she's going crazy. And I'm watching that, and I'm like, rock and wrestling. I should have been a part of that. I'm grabbing the drawers, and I just bring, I'm talking to myself. 
and I'm sitting around with all the bartenders and we're drinking after hours now, you know, counting the money. Not the greatest combination, but it worked. And at some point, this bartender named Smokey came in. And back then, like I told you, my real name is Paige Joseph Walkerberg before I changed it. And they would call me Paige J. Hey, Paige J. Uh, what do you mean rock and wrestling? You should have been a part of that. I said, well, I tried it when I was a kid. They were like, you wrestled? I go, at this time, I'm 31 years old. I go, yeah. He goes, what was your name? I said, Handsome Dallas Page. He went, oh, you can forget about using that gimmick anymore. And everybody started laughing. And then we're drinking and doing shots. And Phil, I'll tell you, I just couldn't get it out of my head. I just think I'm too old to be a wrestler, but I could be a wrestling manager. My name could be Diamond Dallas Page. And I'll have the diamond exchange. And I'm writing this shit down while everybody's drinking and talking. And then I go, okay, I got it. I got it. Check this out. I'm too old to be a wrestler. I said, but Jimmy Hart's got the Hart Foundation. I could be a manager. I could be Diamond Dallas Page. I could have the diamond exchange. They would be my wrestlers. And I'll go, you know, there's not that many. Off the top of my head, I just go, there's not that many hot-looking girls in wrestling, except for Miss Elizabeth. But she's kind of girl next door hot. I said, what if I had a whole stable of the ladies and I called them diamond dolls and they were stripper hot? And Smokey goes, oh, that'll be a stretch. Oh, drink, drink, shot, shot. And I just wrote it all down. And about a week later, I would do these radio commercials where I might throw a synthesizer voice, like, you know, with a reverb and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then I might throw in, oh, don't miss it, hot links, hot links, God, just $1,000, yeah, oh, yeah, Wednesday night. And I might throw in Hulk, I might throw in Jesse Ventura. I could do them, like, spot on back then. And people had seen the boys... That's what we call ourselves. They had seen, you know, Ted DiBiase, you know, Jake Roberts, the Bushwhackers, the SP boys. They seen all these guys in the club. So maybe they're doing the commercials. Maybe they're not. So they call me up. It's called the Party News Network. And I still have this film. And they say, um, we want to interview, um, we want to interview um, Paige for this this the voice thing that these commercials he does. So they film me in my 62 and this right here. They film me and I told you every picture's got a story. They film me riding in my 62 pink Cadillac convertible. By the way, those are some smoking hot so diamond cool. dolls. Wheels, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, they film me at the radio station. And I'm doing you know, a spot, and I'm wearing a WrestleMania 2 T-shirt. And they film me in my office. And at some point, they said, so where does the voice come from? And I'm sitting at my desk where I wrote Diamond Dolls page, the Diamond Exchange, the Diamond Dolls. That's, and I'll tell you, Phil, I don't know if I would have done it or not. But there's a pair of white sunglasses there. So when they say that I grab the glasses and I throw them on, and it becomes like a mask. And I said, the voice comes from Diamond Dallas Page, get it? I was born to be a professional wrestling manager. It's big, it's bad, it's Norma Jean's voice. And I took the glasses off and I kept talking. I always tell everyone, this is a great lesson for anyone listening. Never, uh, never do anything you don't want anyone to see in public, period. In other words, don't get caught doing something stupid because you never know who's watching. The other side of that is you never know who's watching when you do something that's magical and what happened was i get a call in my office about a week later 
right after this six minute spot that talks about, you know, the voice. I get um, a call and the girl goes to me, um, Paige, there's someone on the phone for Diamond Dallas Paige. And I pick up the phone, I go, fuck you, Smokey. And I hang up the phone <laughs> and, and she calls me back. She goes, um, that wasn't Smokey. His name is Smitty. He's got a radio show. I pick up the phone and I go, who is this? It's like, it's Smitty. I saw your spot on the Party News Network. I'd love to have you come on my show. I'm a boxing show. But one day a month, I'm doing wrestling. I go, bro, I don't want to burst your bubble or anything, but I don't really do it. I made all that stuff up. I mean, like, it's just in my head. And he goes... So, you know, I'd love to have you come on. I'm having Captain Lou Albano on. I go, now what's the odds of that? I said, you're having Captain Lou Albano on the show? Do I get to talk to him? He's like, absolutely. You're my expert. I go, I'm in. So I do that. Next month, he asked me to come back to do Sergeant Slaughter. Another fun time. Sergeant Slaughter was such a class act guy. He's an amazing human being. And he says to me, we go for a couple drinks afterwards that night. And he says, you know, you really got to do something with this Diamond Dallas Page thing. I re- I'm telling you, dude, you're such a natural at it. You got to do, I, I do what, Smitty? There's no wrestling here. Got to go all the way to Tampa for wrestling, man. That's 140 miles, man. I go, I don't know what I would do. He said, I got a friend of mine who, Used to be a promoter in the in the boxing world. Now it's a promoter for AWA, which was like the the middle of America. That's the Midwest. They they ran all that territory. And he said, now he's promoting wrestling. His name's Rob Russin. I've got his address. I'll get it when I get home. Come up with something. I go, come up with what? He goes, I don't know. You're creative as hell. Like in my nightclub. Every night was a different night. Every Tuesday, every Monday night was bar appreciation night for all the restaurant and bar people so that they could come and have a great night. Tuesday night was theme night. It might be Rocky Horror. It might be Wild Wing thing. Every night it was a different, every Tuesday, different promotion. Every Wednesday was Hot Wings. Every Thursday was Olympus Contest. Every Friday was Diamond Gym. I mean, every night there was something different going on. He said, Come up with something. You'll figure it out. So I come up with three guys who want to be wrestlers. I create characters for them. One I called um, Big Bad John. And he had his sleeves cut off and a hard hat and a chain around his neck. His face was all dirty because he was one of my diamond miners from Johannesburg, South Africa, don't you know? And then I had Rock Hard Rick that we doing for oh does that close that uh i had rock hard rick who is just twisted steel and sex appeal and i had ted e bear who was a midget and he used to work the door for me on a step stool and uh and i had hot diamond dolls in it and i made up this tape and i sent it to the, that guy rob russell he calls me back two weeks later and he says, um, listen, we, we, you know, we like your stick. You know, we, we've showed it around. We want to bring you and your boys in for a tryout. You know, but we've got one question. You know, no one's ever heard of you guys. Where are you working at? Um, well, Rob, the truth is those guys can't wrestle. What? <laughs> Why would you send us videotape? I go, because it's like a secret society. No one knows how to get in. Bottom line is, don't call us. We'll call you. As fate would have it, there was a guy named Paulie Dangerously, whose real name is Paul Heyman, who's one of the biggest stars in the world in professional wrestling. That's not a wrestler. And he was a young kid who could talk back then. And he left the AWA and went, to the NWA, which would become WCW. And it left a huge void for a young guy to talk. 
Next thing you know, <laughs> this happened just I just said, uh, podcast about this. I'm managing these two guys, Pat Tanaka, Paul Diamond. That's the first Diamond doll ever. This is our first day in wrestling ever. And I know that because I only used Leanne once. Now, that outfit, all that stuff, I've got my legs spread because Pat is five foot eight. With those cowboy boots on, I'm close to six, seven. So I look like Andre the Giant as a manager, but it worked. And we had a, it was the beginning of not making any money. It took four years before I made any money. I just kept investing, kind of like DDPY. You know, it, like wrestling, you go back to 1988 when I started as a manager, color commentator, worked for Florida Championship Wrestling, got Dusty Rhodes. And who took me in and put me under his wing without Dusty Rhodes, there is no Diamond Dallas Page. Without Jake the Snake Roberts, there's no three-time world champion. The two of those guys mentored me throughout my career. And that's one of the reasons why I was so successful. But no one believed it was possible that I would ever be a mid-card guy, never mind a top guy, never mind a world champion. Never mind a Hall of Famer. They never thought it. And I tell people all the time, there's only one person that has to believe in you. That's you. That's it. I say it at the end of Relentless. You have to be relentless. You have to believe in yourself and never underestimate the power someone gives you by believing in you. Like that is the biggest thing that I've learned. And you said it earlier. It's all about the mindset. What is the story you tell yourself? I wrote this book three years ago, and it's called Positively Unstoppable, The Art of Owning It. It is that six-inch piece of real estate in between your ears. And when you own it, just about anything is possible. That's crazy. So so in amongst all this, what I've lost in this, this, this kind of story about how this all came about, right? Is at this point where you've done this, this this promo, you've shifted off, they've looked at it, they've called you back in again. But at this point, where where are you at with respect to wrestling? I mean, you know, were you wrestling regularly no, with, with no, the skills? I, there, I, or I, you go in I, and have to look? I have no, because I was a manager and a color commentator. Because you just can't get in the ring and wrestle, you know. It's it's like I couldn't ballroom dance right now. You know what I mean? I couldn't. I've seen them do it a million times, but I couldn't grab a girl and ballroom dance. So, so it would take you, a long. So if you if you wasn't wrestling skills at this point, zero. I'm not doing. I'm not wrestling. I'm a mouthpiece. Right. I'm the guy. Like, like Paul wrestle, Heyman is. You'd wrestled back in the seventies, though, yeah. Three times. Oh, right. Okay. Three. Only three times. <laughs> three times. And I would wrestle once in 89 because my wrestler that I was managing lost to Dick Slater. And it's really just for fun in a show. You know, basically, as a manager, you get your ass kicked. <laughs> you know, but I wrestled once in the 80s. So two decades, I wrestled four times, but it was in two decades. But I, I didn't start to wrestle until I finally got to WCW, which was owned by Ted Turner. That's where AEW, that's where those guys wrestle on that channel. And it's, it's worldwide, not worldwide, but it's, 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 it's all over our entire country. And um, what happened was I worked myself up to getting – to be on WCW as a manager and with seven months left on my contract, they pull me aside because, you know, you know, I look like this guy and I dress like that guy and between the clothes and the bling and the wrap and the hair and the diamond dolls, I was taking too much away from the wrestler. And 
when I was told that I couldn't do it anymore by a guy named Magnum TA, he said, you know, we can't let you manage anymore. And I'm like, what, what did I do wrong? I'll fix it. He's like, bro, it's not your fault. He's like, we should have put a pair of tights and boots and see if you could do this. Now at the time, I'm 35 and a half. I thought at 31, it was too old to start. But here I am at 35 and a half, and I have seven months left on my contract. So I went down the power plant where they teach guys and guys learn and practice their craft. And I went down there and they beat the hell out of me. Because they, they it's like, like forget. Kids. It must have been like 20, 20 year olds. And but, yes, 20, 22, 24, 26. And then there's guys who've been there a long time and haven't been put up. And they see you come in there and they're like, now he's waving. Now he's going to be a wrestler at 35. Well, let's show him. Let's show him how physical this is. And they beat the hell out of me. But I just kept coming. And it got to a point where. I would set the precedent at the power plant because no one, and I mean, no one is going to outwork me. I don't, you know, I believe that work ethic beats talent every time talent doesn't work hard. I am the first one, Phil, in professional wrestling to ice his knees and ice his back. They didn't know what the hell I was doing. They're like, what are you doing? I said, yeah, I'm 35 and a half, man. Uh, you know, I'm trying to keep down the, the inflammation. It took five years before they ever brought a trainer in and anyone else ever used ice but me. I filmed all my own matches. Everybody thought I was being a, you know, a mark for myself. No, I was using this game films. Today, look on YouTube. There's a billion kids who film their matches on, you know, with 12 people there. You know, I did, every, I filmed every match I ever was in, except for it was on TV because I could get it and watch it then. But I did applied kinesiologist, chiropractic, deep muscle massage therapy, acupuncture. I started to really clean up how I ate, because what you eat, well, you would never put ethanol in a Ferrari. You know, you've got to put real food. And the fascinating part, some of the greatest athletes in the world, when they're 20, 21, 22, 23, 25, they eat shit. They eat horribly. And their lifespan in that profession is going to be shortened because of it i'll give you two examples three examples of guys who own it tom brady yep it isn't just how he works out it's what he puts in his mouth what he puts in his in between his ears lebron james spends a million dollars a year on his body russell simmons the quarterback for uh, Seattle Seahawks, a million dollars. If you walk through my house, the next place after this room you'd walk into is my gym, and then you'll see a hyperbaric chamber. That's 12 PSI. I just ordered one from Australia. That's 15 PSI. It's also $57,000, but... It's, I'm healing my body at a cellular rate, and not just my body, my brain. You also see a hype, besides the hyperbaric change, you'll see a cryo machine, a infrared sauna, a tear board, steam machine, a steam room, a hot tub. Um, what else do we got in there? I don't remember. That's all I can remember right now. But I use all this shit every day, and it's all about holding back the hands of time. If you play a contact sport where you get concussions, like 
football, and I think soccer, man. It seems like those guys, your your football over there, seem like those guys beat the hell out of themselves pretty badly too. Rugby, for sure, <laughs> you should have a hyperbaric chamber because it's the only way you're going to get oxygen on your brain is to have 12 PSI up. That's how it breaks the blood brain barrier. And, you know, these are all things I do. Bro, I'm, I'm going to be 65 in two months. And, and at any point in time, I could be standing here sitting and talking, and I could take either one of my foot feet with squishy pair of sneakers, push it out in front of me, or pull it out to my side and have a conversation to you at 6'4", 224 pounds, and two months from 65. Now... I challenge that to any of the footballers out there who are watching. <laughs> if you're over 45, if you can do that like that. The guys who do my program, it's all because I healed myself. Because what happened is my career blew up when I was 40, which was in 96. And it was at the end of 96 when it blew up. You look at me at the beginning of 96 and the end of 96, it's like two different people. And my confidence level going into 97 was through the roof. And that's, the, to me, is the most important thing, building confidence. And 97 and 98, I was in 20, I was in 13 out of 24 main event pay-per-views or semi-main event. Um, Going into 99, I ruptured my L4 and L5. And it wasn't the bump of Kevin Nash hit me with a power bomb. It was the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. And it was like the worst pain ever. And the emotional gravity of pulling myself down from what I was learning from, I went to see three of the top spine specialists in the country. And every one of them said the same thing. So just, awesome to, just job. to put it into context there, so you've done your L4, your L5, and, and theoretically that's, you've broken your back, right? It just hasn't, much. It, it hasn't <laughs> created huge amounts of nerve damage or anything like that. So obviously, you know, there's different magnitudes of broken back. Right? You'll go, your nerves, your nerves for sitting down when you've done that, are, I, I can't even explain it. Like you can't sit down in the beginning. Yeah, like like, like shocks running through everything, right? Oh, uh, it's brutal, man. And then when you have those three spine specials, like these guys are the best. And they're all telling me, like, you're done. I just signed a multi-million dollar three-year deal. I mean, like two months ago. And now they're telling me that. And I know in six months that contract goes away. I didn't have guaranteed money. And I worked so hard to get here. It really wasn't about the money as much as it was being able to continue to live the dream. And I'm a guy, the first 42 years of my life, I was 42 and a half when this happened. Really, 42 and three quarters. And um, it emotionally took my feet out. I'm the guy at 42 who wouldn't be caught dead doing yoga like i'm that guy and my wife at the time kimberly she was trying to talk me into doing yoga and i really it was it was like a really it was so stupid you know for me to think like that but that's how my brain was and she finally got me down there and she showed me a couple of like vhs tape, tapes of these women teaching i'm like no no, no. And then I came across a guy named Brian Kest, who is one, me, today me and him are good buddies. But back then he was just a guy on a VHS tape who was a yogi, but there was something about him that I liked. And just because he's a real, he's the real deal, he's super authentic. But I couldn't do any of his moves. I mean, back then, back then, he didn't show modifications. So I had to figure those out. So, but by three weeks into it, just doing plain power yoga, I started to feel a significant difference. Now, I'm still doing rehab for my back too, five days a week, 
I go do rehab and I've rehabbed both shoulders by this time, both knees by this time from surgeries that I know a lot about it. And the biggest thing that God kind of gifted me at was figuring out how to break up scar tissue. And more than anything, as you know, it's motion. And what ended up happening is one night I mixed the yoga positions. You'll never hear me say pose or posture. I'm an athlete. I understand getting a position. I understand play a position. So just mentally, the, you know, the words make more sense to me. So I mixed the yoga positions with the rehab. Like, wow, that really works. Then I started throwing old school calisthenics. And I had to do them with a slow burn movement, which instead of doing a push-up like this, I had to lower three, two, one. And then I'd stay there, three, two, one. Then I'd come up, three, two, one. It just was easier for me because of my back. In the beginning, I started on my knees. Eventually, I got off my knees. Eventually, those three second push-ups became five. Those five second push-ups became 10. Those 10 second push-ups became sets of 10. So my body's really getting stronger. But the thing I learned the most, because I wear a heart monitor. I've been wearing a heart monitor for 24 years while I work out. 24. And this just happened to be the biggest reason why later I would do this. And because I could see where my heart rate was too high or I'm not really doing anything. I'm not engaging. I figured out every time you flex or engage a muscle, your heart has to beat faster to get the blood to the muscle. Here's a good example. Laying down, your heart rate is the lowest ever, right? Yeah. Sit up, your heart rate goes up, right? Stand, walk, jog, run, sprint. It continues to go up. I figured out how to do that standing still. I've got a kid who works out with me because he does it the best. And he's a runner. He walks around with a 48 heart rate. He can take his heart rate from 50, 48, 50, 52 to 160, raising his arms three times. Crazy. It's because you're because you're engaging your toes, your quads, your glutes, your adductors, your biceps, your triceps. When you open up your fingers and you time under tension, that's all we're doing. So, you're, so, so, so at no this point, you're hitting up this this almost hybrid of you've got your rehab mixed in there, you've got yoga mixed in there, you've got some calisthenics, yeah. bit, you know, in there. You've got your old kind of Charles Atlas isokinetic stuff. You've got your exactly your, uh, exactly isometrics in there. You've got the works right, and you're just blending all of this together at this point, right? And what happens in three months? I'm back in the ring. I remember they told me I'm never going back in there. Three months later, I'm back in the ring. At 42, they say my career's over. At 43, I got that thing. And that's like our Oscar, you know? And it was, it was just, it proved all the hard work is work, worth it. I always say work ethic uh, equals results. But in my Hall of Fame ring, Inside, it says work ethic equals dreams, explanation point, DDP. And I would have the craziest run ever. And you've seen Relentless. You know, I start out blowing my back out yeah, yeah. in the beginning of the show. And then by the time we get to the end, Cody's got me in the AEW. And I'm jumping off the top rope. and going to be 64. <laughs> you know? So... Um, great ride, man. The thing I love the most about Relentless, let, let me let me read a review for you that I, I just got, and I, I loved it. And it was because it was so truthful. So this guy writes, he writes, 
The name of it is Simply Inspiring. He gave me five stars. He said, admittedly, there were a few moments when I felt like I was watching the most well-produced infomercial ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something in a minute. <laughs> he said, he said, nonetheless, it's pretty damn epic. And in these unstable times, it's quite inspiring to see how the positive intention behind DDPY rippled out into the world to create an actual positive change. I've had the DVD set sitting around for quite a while. I love this part. But I think I'll finally try it out instead of merely having it and pretending that's good enough. <laughs> he says, is that great? He said, the DDP crew, the DDPY crew is making the world a better place. And this film documents that fact. I, I, I wish this kid would have put his real name, just put N. Thomas. If he would have put his name that he that he uh, invested in my in my in my uh, in my product, I would have called him. Yeah. I tried and, and, to find and, and, and out his number. Having watched Relentless, knowing what I know about you, you would yeah. have. Like, no, <laughs> I would have. Probably said to put his doorstep. Yes, I <laughs> am him because he, it's so authentic. Like, let's do this. Let's talk about a guy named Steve Jobs. If you're watching a documentary or a movie about Steve Jobs, what's it going to be about? Yeah. Apple? Yeah. Th it's going to be all about Apple. Yeah. See, 100% of it is going to be about I, Apple. I watched Relentless, right? Only recently, because th this only came out on Amazon just recently, right? It's certainly in the UK, right? I think it might have been out a bit longer in the US. And, and I watched it. And at the end of it, I thought that was really good. Really enjoyed it. Really inspirational. You know, know a lot more about Dallas. Know a little bit more, you know, deeper details about you, right? You get quite emotional at certain points of it. Yeah. And then I sat back and I thought, that felt like a massive infomercial in many respects. <laughs> And, it, and it, the thing is, it is, right? And I'm not going to ask yeah. you whether that was the intent or not, but but it does, it, it, it sells your program incredibly well, but it's uh, this great documentary about you, about how it all came about, how it evolved, how it went from, you know, uh, 2004, you created Yoga for Regular Guys, right? Off the right, back of you right. rehabbing and doing all of your stuff and then and then just turned it into this thing, right? Over the, the you, you know, a 15-year period, right? And right. eventually that evolved because obviously you've been referring to DDPY, right? And a lot of the listeners right. will not have a clue at this point what, what DDPY is. So DDPY uh, is DDP, Dallas, Diamond Dallas Page, yoga, yoga right? And right. this, this how I and, and Relentless tells this story about how this evolved and how it came about. And it tells some of these stories. And the funny thing is, is that uh, Arthur Borman, right? Right. That, Disabled veteran. Yep. I watched that video of him that, that Steve, you put together, right? Right. Probably, and, and you might be correct me here on the dates here, but mm. I must have watched that 10 plus years ago. Well, and, and I didn't, I didn't know. No, wait, 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 no, wait, 10, 11, it was 2012, it went, so it was eight years ago. Yeah, nine years ago. Where nine at the years. end of it, he's running, yeah. right? And, right. And I remember the video, but obviously at the time in the UK, you know, DDPY, nobody had a clue what, what it was. And, right. and obviously people knew you from wrestling and they didn't know that this had evolved because it was very much, you know, everything was stateside. And, and I watched it again. I goes, I've seen this and I, and I, <laughs> and I, I, I remembered it. But, you know, back right. then, you know, when YouTube kind of kicked off and everybody was like, I must have seen a million videos. But this particular video, I remembered it to a T, this story, wow. this art yeah. form, because it was, it's massively impactful, right? And obviously, as you developed all this, you're, you, you know, you're a pro wrestler. You've got this pedigree behind you. And, and you've taken something which, again, you had that same view of, right? You've looked at it and go, guys don't do yoga. 
you know, it's all this right. hippie and incense and all right, carry right, on. Right. And guys don't do this. And this was the first, you know, notion that you had of it all. And then all of a sudden you've made this accessible to all these people. You know, you've got, you know, veterans, you've got football players, you've got, you've got just, again, regular guys, right? Who are right. all of a sudden going, oh, it's actually okay to do this because Dallas is doing it. You know? Right, Dallas right, is doing right. it. And Dallas, Dallas right. made a career out being in spandex. Mm. You know, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? Right, right. You know, there's no person out there that a, that a professional wrestler makes spandex and lycra look manly, right? So, so you created this, exactly. created this program, right? And it, and it's evolved. And Relentless tells this story, right? So, it, you know, anybody, it's on Amazon Prime, right? You know, and it's a fantastic watch. And it, it tells this incredible story. And obviously there's Arthur Borman, there's various other people in there that you've helped along the way. And like I said, you get you get quite emotional at times in there. And, and you can tell it's, yeah. you know, it's all very genuine. And and off the back of that, you know, one of the big questions I had was wrestling was obviously this massive thing, right? You know, you're rolling out into these arenas with, I mean, what kind of numbers are these arenas holding? 22,000. We sold, when we were hot, when we were white hot, everybody knows who Prince is. Yeah. And Prince is from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's at the top of the, yeah, America. And Prince is, was a god in many. Me and Randy Savage were on the top of the card that night. And it was a nitro. And we were going to wrestle after Nitro. We broke Prince's record of selling out the 21,000 seat arena in less than seven minutes. Wow. I mean, right. How, how, like, how, that's that's how hard it was. You know, how, how are people buying tickets that fast back then when I the internet know. was dreadful, right? <laughs> right. I, 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 I really... I don't know. And the only reason I know it was true was because they, Randy was busy doing something. So they asked me to go up and take the picture under the fastest sellout ever in the building. Wow. That's, the only, that's the only reason I knew because, you know, because things were going so fast. Like it felt like, yeah. like they, it was so fast. It was so much fun. And you're surrounded you know, at that point by, because there's this one thing about you, which is clearly very evident. And, and I don't know whether this has developed. And again, maybe you can tell me is that, you know, were you always like this larger than life character? I mean, you've got, you've got the, you've got the perfect kind of gift of the gab for wrestling. Right. And obviously that's how you eventually sort of, you know, maneuvered yourself into that position you were in as the manager. Right. But right. have you always been like this? Or was this a, a byproduct of being in the in the bars and the clubs and the oh yeah, like yeah. kid? Were you always, you know, super vocal, super fast, you know? And yeah, I'm not as a kid so much. Uh, you know, I was really good, you know, our football. I was a really good player. Um and, and I always thought that I would be playing American football at you know, 10, 11, 12, like. That's going to be me. And that's, and then you, I, walked, I guess you were a big kid, right? So you were six. Yeah, five, I was, right? I was, yeah. But at the time, at that time I was 12. So I was, you know, maybe five, nine or whatever. Yeah. I was big really for big for our, 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 our little, we call it pop warners before you get to high school. And I walked out in front of a car. I said it earlier. Hit my, was left, knee, my, right? right. And then I flew. And there was no such thing as rehab back then. And they wouldn't let me play football anymore. I was devastated. Now, you also have to understand, I was reading at a third grade level at 30. I made a decision I was going to learn how to read when I was 31. And today I'm a pretty decent reader, but it took decades to get to that point. Yeah, and fast, so when right? you, it's not. No, I had ADD and dyslexia at a time no one knew what the hell ADD or dyslexia was. They just thought we were stupid. And you get put in you know, the slower classes and 
I, you know, it's how they, they didn't know how to perceive it back then. I knew I wasn't stupid, you know, but I knew I had a real problem with reading. So, you know, ath athletics was my escape. And I didn't, I came from a broken home. My grandmother raised me, you know? So I pretty much raised myself, you know, pretty much my whole life. So um, when it came to, uh, you know, um, getting hit by that car, and now I can't play football anymore, the only two sports they would let me play is baseball, Yep. which takes at least one person to throw back and forth with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's got to be two people. Yeah. And basketball. And I sucked in both. But basketball, you can play by yourself. You can do layups. You can do hooks. You can do foul shots. You can do dribbling. You can throw it off the wall. You can turn and shoot. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do by yourself. And... In seventh grade, I didn't make the basketball team, but I didn't care. I hated basketball. Well, in eighth grade, there, there was no more football. There was no... Oh, let me get you back on here. There was no more football. And I had to learn something new. And I sat on the bench when I made the basketball team in eighth grade. And I swore that would never happen again. So I played ball every day, all day, all summer long. And I got better and better and better. And that's the best thing I could tell you for the best lesson I ever learned. Work ethic equals results. And when you really put the work in, it equals dreams. So, and, and I try to explain that all the way through. Relentless started before it was relentless. It was something we were trying to show people if they came to our website, like, who are we? How did this happen? Yeah, yeah. But by the second time, and I'm talking about the second, by the second time, my boys who do that stuff for me sent me a sent me a Steve called me up, Steve you, and he said, You should look at this. Make sure you watch it from beginning to end. He goes, You tell me what you think. And I call him back. I go, This is bigger than what we think it is. And he goes, I, I totally agree. And so we have footage from 17 years ago. We started searching through everything. And it became, I think it's one of the most inspiring videos out there. Hey, Mark Barrow, give it over to say hello, brother. Don't worry, buddy. All right, man. Good to see you. It's my buddy Phil. This is Mark Barrow. Hey, hey, man. You doing all right? <laughs> I got him. He's doing good. Yeah. So I, got, I got one more for this one. We're hanging out. He's coming over for dinner. So um, bottom line is it just it taught me. It taught me so much about no matter what it has to do. It doesn't matter if it's learning how to read or play basketball or learning your craft. No matter what it is, doing a podcast. You know, the more you prepare for that person coming on there, there's guys like yourself, like, they have the work done. They just don't care. Okay, let's get him on the thing and I'll do a podcast with him. <laughs> you know, those people never really go anywhere. The people who go places are the people who put the time in to know who their subject is, who's coming on. It's 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 awesome. We could I, I could quite happily talk to you or listen to you for the next several hours telling us stories about everything. But uh Relentless is now out in the UK on Amazon, right? Yep. Uh, yep, when I was DDP on Prime. Yoga. Tell me more about DDP Yoga in the UK. Yeah, let me, let me just say that the best, because we still sell, I can't believe how many people invest in the DVDs. It blows my mind. But our app is off the charts. And if you just go to ddpy.com or ddpyoga.com, yep. and you go to, to where the app is, you can get seven days free on the app. So no one can even tell me that, well, you know, I, I can't really afford to try. I don't want to take a chance. Like, no, go try it. Costs nothing. And you don't have to pay customs or any of the other stuff. <laughs> and what's on my app? Oh, your workouts will kill me. Um, my workouts start off in bed. I created bed flex where you're laying in bed. Then I created chair force where you're sitting in a chair. Then I created stand strong where you're using a chair help to build your bowels, help you get up and down. Then you go to beginner and it goes all the way to psycho extreme crazy stuff. 
And there's that incredible scene at the end of Relentless, right? Where the, the lady gets up off the floor and obviously... Oh, oh. Crazy, huh? So, so, it's so amazing. And that's why if you're, if, you, if you're listening to us here, just take the time. It was so funny. Um, one of my buddies, who knows everything, he's watched everything on me. And he called me up. He goes, give me a call when you get a chance. I get on the phone with him. He goes, I thought I knew everything. He goes, and I found out I didn't. He goes, dude, I loved, loved, loved Relentless. Plus, man, you lit a fire under my ass, man. And that's what it's about. It's, it's about getting, picking people up and, you know, getting them to be the best self that they can be. And if you don't, if you do Facebook, don't listen to a word I have to say about it. any of my stuff. Go to a members group. It started with one guy, Chris Caporiano. And then it was five guys. And then it was 12. And then it was 100. Now there's over 55,000 people. DDP yoga, one word. It's the most inspiring place you will ever go. People come there looking to be inspired, you know, looking to, to wake their brain. And so many of them become the people who are inspiring others and that's the best quantum ball bro will you do my will you do I, i've got these i you i don't know if uh, did tell you about the jack straps did he tell you no. about them the bf uh, the bfr yeah no. blood flow restriction ah okay yes yes i know blood flow okay. Restriction. okay will you and i know you do what you do everything but for 30 days i will send you these DDPY jack straps. And, you know, they go like, you know, you slide it up here. First of all, you, if you look inside of it, it's got this cool little uh, belt, this um, gel pad, right? Yeah. And then this is where you pop it to pull it or you jack it up. And to show you what I mean by that, if I pull this, so it goes in and gets tight and clamps off and shuts the venous flow, like, I don't yep, remember yep, yep, exactly all that. The bottom line is, when you slide it up here, you, you get it eventually fit into your arm, and then you clasp it down, and then, at say we're doing back, or militaries, or preacher curls. No, wait. I'm talking air. When you crank these babies up, and you start doing, like, just curls with not thing but isokinetics and you're one of the few people i know knows what that means you know it's isometrics moving like the pump like look at that pump i've got going i'm not doing anything there's no weight there like this is mind-boggling the density in your muscle and i pop it when i pop it boom when i flex it it spins itself so now it's loose again if I send these to you, will you do the program for 30 days on my jack workouts? And then I'll come back when we talk about it. Cool. We can do that. Will you do it? Yeah. Will you do, do it? it? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's, uh, as soon as we close it, close off here, I'll tell you where uh, my, my email, send it to me and I'll hook you up and I'll send it out to you. Cool. I'm going to, I'm going to follow up just and finish on that question I kind of went down the rabbit hole of that we'd never quite got to, but I was saying about the arenas, right? So you were in these big sellout right. arenas, it was buzzing. Blah, right. blah. How does that compare to how, how you know, these results and these people coming through and all the stuff that you're doing now, how does it compare? I, I explain it like this. When I was wrestling, living a dream, it was like the coolest thing I'd ever done. What I'm doing today blows it away because it's so one-to-one -one. if you know a group to me you know it's like if you knew how many people i was 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 helping i got it I, i'm going to take it up those guys will have to wait for me because now you said something because I, I i gotta i have to read this thing this is the kind of shit that happens in my life okay my twitter's going bing Thing. And for some reason, notifications is on. Someone's sending me a message. I'm going to leave you with this. He writes me this. I, I, it's like 9 o'clock at night. I don't look at it till 12.30 in the morning, right? And it writes, sir, not even sure how to address you. 
Mr. Page, Dallas, DDP. In March of this year, I was at my absolute heaviest. My diet was poor. My body was falling apart. And I was having some serious health issues. I got to the point where my doctor saw me for a visit and said something along the lines of, I didn't think I'd see you again. Wow. I honestly thought you'd die in between visits. A week later, my wife comes into the bedroom and tells me that our marriage is over. She found a new boyfriend and I needed to leave. With as much dignity as I could muster, I moved out of my house and into an apartment. The pandemic had taken a hold. So I was experiencing health issues that the medical professionals thought was going to kill me. The virus was wreaking havoc on all my body while my entire life was falling apart. A friend of mine sold me a copy of YRG. Those are my first DVDs from 15 years ago. And I never really sunk my teeth in because I was so busy with work and living a life that was killing me. Since there was nowhere to go but up, I put a copy of the DVD and did Fat Burner. It hurt, but it was a welcome distraction from an incredible broken heart. One of my colleagues that worked on us, I was making a change and asked me what I was doing. When I told him YRG, he told me, you know, DDP wrote a new book. You might like it. After work, I went to Barnes and Noble and picked up Positively. Now, the name is Positively Unstoppable, The Art of Owning It. This is what he remembered and picked up a copy of Positively Owning It. The book made me see the truth in my situation. Yes, my wife drop kicked my heart into my ass. Yes, she was with someone new. And yes, I had to start over again at 35. All these things considered, it was my responsibility to react and take charge. I couldn't change what had happened, but I could take control of where I was going. My diet, my exercise, my lifestyle all became contingent on what I was doing. Instead of looking at my sudden lifestyle change as something that happened to me, I had drawn inspiration from positively owning it and began seeing my situation as an opportunity to be excited about the changes in my life. I was becoming strong. I didn't see dieting as being depressed about what I couldn't eat, but being jazzed about what I could eat. Through your wisdom and your encouragement, I began listening to my body. I paid attention to what my body ran well on, what my body didn't react well to, and what foods affected my moods in different ways. Restrictive diets don't work. And because I was listening to my body, what it was asking for, I didn't have to go on a restrictive diet. I substituted garbage for high-octane fuels. I left my house October 4th, 2020, at my heaviest. When I weighed in at the doctor last time, I had shed 60 pounds in four months. My blood pressure has improved. My mental clarity, my stamina and my mood. My body is stronger than it's been since I was 25. I still have a very long way to go, but I know I am equipped for the battle, not just to fight, but to win. I'm sure you hear this a lot, Mr. Dallas. <sighs> it's powerful. But you absolutely saved my life. The work, the workouts are encouraging and tough. Your book is incredible. Diamond, you know my own name. Diamond Dallas Page took me from someone who is falling asleep, standing up in the shower, to someone I can finally look in the mirror and be proud of. You are doing God's work, sir. As a kid who stayed up late, <laughs> who stayed up late Monday nights to see the the. Um, the NWO get a heaping helping of the diamond cutter and remembers 
hating Dennis Rodman for interrupting DDP joining the Wolf Pack. I can't imagine a better spirit on this earth to inspire my journey. This is him at critical mass of 552 pounds. That was, I read that, right? It's 1230 at night, 1231. I text him, send me your phone number. Bing comes right back. I call them at 1232. I talked to them for 45 minutes. Wow. That was four months ago. He was down 60 pounds. Eight months total, he's down 146 pounds. That's crazy. So it really puts it in perspective because, oh, God, he's so full of shit. He's trying to tell me 22,000 people screaming his name, and this is more important. I get those letters all the time. So, yeah, it's way bigger. It's a different way bigger. Type, it's a different type of fun, right? Yeah, it's a different kind of different type of fun. You know, you feel great about yourself. Everything, anyone who really knows me, my girl Paige knows me inside out. Every decision I make. Is about how does it make me feel about me? And I'm not going to do something fucked up unless it could only hurt me. Yeah, yeah. Everything I do is around, okay, am I good with that? I'm good with that. I'm going to do it. If I'm not good with that. I'm not doing it. Dallas. You're an incredible character and you're doing some great stuff. It's, uh, it's, been, you, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you for, no. for taking the time middle of the afternoon to, uh, to speak no. to us. But uh, yeah, uh, we, we'll catch you up in about 30 days, roughly. Thir you'll get, you'll, I'm going to try to get them as fast as you, you as fast <laughs> as you can. So as soon as you get them, you're going to hit me back and uh, we will get you started. I, I want to hear what you think about the DDPY Jack Straps, because I know that's what you do. You work with so many top athletes. And any any of those guys that you want to put on my on my thing, I just I do it. Like I take care of the NFL, all the fucking guys, all the NFL alumni, you know, all the WWE wrestlers, any of your guys you want to get on my program, dude. All you do is put a little double text with me and say this is who, set them up and I'll hook them up and I'll have them for life. Cool. All right, awesome. buddy. Great Thank talk you for to your you. time, buddy. Hey, it's my pleasure. Soon, all right. Take care. Enjoy your, enjoy your dinner. All right. Now listen. Now listen. Dallas at diamonddallaspage.com. Cool. Email me today and just, you know, we'll have each other's number and all that shit. If you got a WhatsApp, I'm pretty sure it's just Diamond Dallas Page. All right. Cool. We'll figure that shit out. Send me the email first. Talk later, bro. Thank we'll you, do. man. Take care. Enjoy your dinner.